um, we get started. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, Isaac, that would be great. Well, we'd love to know that you're all here. So we'd like to take a roll call in attendance and welcome you all to the session. Please stay muted and use the chat function to introduce yourself. All information shared in the chat box will be included in the notes for today's meeting. Um, please enter your name and preferred pronouns. Feel free to refrain from introductions if you do not wish to have this information to be recorded or included in the meeting notes. Um, please include your agency, the department you're in, your role, and your title. And we have designated times throughout this session for question and answers because we'd hope to make this session as interactive as possible. Next slide, please. And before we begin, we'd like to do a land and labor acknowledgement. We are currently occupying the unceded lands of many First Peoples, Coast Salish people, Muckleshoot, Squamish, Siliquamish, and Duwamish. We acknowledge and thank local First Nations for the centuries of land stewardship that, that long predates the arrival of European settlers. We honor those who are struggling for recognition and reparations for historical acts of genocide and ongoing erasure. We remind you to be aware of the spaces you occupy locally, that these lands were stolen from First People in the name of white settler colonialism, and that you seek ways to continue your education and give back to local indigenous communities. And here's the Duwamish Tribes web website, um, http www.duwamishtribe.org. We also must acknowledge that most of what we know about this country today, including its culture, economic growth, and development throughout history and across time, has been made possible by the labor of enslaved Africans and their ascendants who survived the horror of the transatlantic trafficking of their people, chattel slavery, and Jim Crow. We are indebted to their labor and their sacrifice, and we must acknowledge the tremors of that violence through the generations and the resulting impact that can still be felt and witnessed today. And that's by Dr. Kara T.J. Stewart. Next slide, please. This session, the recording, all notes and introductions are a matter of public record and subject to disclosure, as are all the RFP materials and applications that are received. So this is just a statement of propriety and confidential information. The State of Washington's Public Record Act release disclosure of public records under Washington State Law reference RCW Chapter 4256, the Public Records Act, dates that all material received and created by the City of Seattle are considered public records. These records include, but are not limited to, RFP responses, budget worksheets, board rosters, and RFP materials, including written or electronic correspondence. In addition, HSD RFP application materials are released to rating committee members, and rating committee members must sign and adhere to the confidentiality and conflict of interest statement. Personal identifiable information, PII, entered on these materials are subject to the Washington Public Records Act and may be subject to disclosure to a third party requester. Some examples of personal identifying identifiable information include first name, last name, date of birth, social security number, financial account number, driver's license, or other state identification number. HSD, however, does not require social security numbers on application materials or reports. For doing business with the city of HSD, it's recommended to obtain a federal taxpayer identification, EIN, number. And please let us know if there's any reason why your identity needs to remain private for any safety reasons. Thank you. Next slide, please. This is an overview of what we'll be speaking about today. Hope this information session brings more clarity to this RFP process, but please also refer to the RFP guidelines and application documents. This session is an opportunity for us to interact and for you to ask questions. If you are a processor like me and would like to ask questions later, please feel free to email me and um, Judith can put my email address in the chat. The agenda includes an introduction, a timeline, our theory of change, background and requirements, submission instructions, review and rating process, some tips for submitting your application, the appeal process, and questions and answers. Next slide, please. So why did HSD release this RFP in 2022 on June 24th? The City of Seattle requires that public dollars are released every four years for competitive bids. 
The 2022 Gender-Based Violence Survivor Series Services RFP is open in the competitive funding process. Existing grantees are not guaranteed to be selected, continued to be funded, or funded at the same level. For agency application guidelines and information, go to the website included below, https www.seattle.gov slash human services slash for providers slash funding dash opportunities. Over almost $11 million is available through HSD's general fund for this GBV survivor services RFP. The purpose of HSD funded gender-based violence services RFP is to elevate Seattle's regional continuum of coordinated and comprehensive GBV service strategies by contracting with a diverse and expert group of providers to provide five programming approaches, such as mobile flexible advocacy, shelter and housing, therapeutic services, civil legal aid, and specialized services for marginalized populations. And we'll get more in depth into these five programming approaches later on in the session. Initial awards will be made for the period of January 1st, 2023 to December 31st, 2023, and then annually throughout 2026. Renewals are contingent upon agency performance and HSD funding availability. Next slide, please. So this is just a definition of gender-based violence and um, part of the reason why we called the RFP a gender-based violence survivor services RFP. Gender-based violence, GBV, is an umbrella term to describe any for form of violence that is rooted in rigid gender roles, oops, <laughs> that reinforce the power imbalance of individuals. GBV includes domestic violence, GB, sexual assault, SA, and commercial sexual exploitation. DSE. GBV is rooted in structural inequalities and gender identities and is characterized by the abuse of physical, emotional, or financial power and control. Although women and girls and non-binary people experience gender-based violence at much higher levels, men and boys also experience GBV, particularly sexual violence, as any time anyone does not conform to what's expected of their gender, they run the risk of being targets of violence. Next slide, please. Here is our general funding timeline, and some of the dates may be subject to change. The funding was announced on June 24th. Um, the question and answers will be posted online Monday, um, August 1st. Um, and before that, the deadline to receive questions will be Friday, July 29th at 5 p.m. The application deadline is August 8th, 2022 at noon. The review and rating process will happen in August um, for several weeks. Our award announcement will be October, and the contract negotiation execution will be between October and December of 2022. And then the funding period begins January 1st, 2023. Next slide, please. This phase of change is an HSD tool that is used in the RFP planning process to ensure that we are centering racial equity goals, that we're using empirical recent data to inform HSD investment priorities. This is a high level overview wheel of what the theory of change is. Um, it starts with the population, who is it that we want to affect, which is people in Seattle, and um, the desired re results is improving safety and eradicating gender-based violence. The indicators is how do we know that we're succeeding? Um, racial equity, who are the communities of color with the highest disparities, the strategies and activities, what will we do to achieve the result? How are we going to implement programming? Performance measures, how will we know if our strategies and activities are working? The quantity, how many people were served? How much was done? The quality, how well was it done? At, um, satisfaction surveys by survivors. Um, impact, is anyone really better off in our community? Next slide. This is a more specific in-depth template guide and what was used to create our own theory change table, which is in the RFP guidelines and application. Refer to page sixes, six and seven in the guideline and application for more specifics. Our desired result is that all people in Seattle are free from gender-based violence. The priority population is the victims and survivors of gender-based violence. And the focus are BIPOC communities, Latinx, AIAP, Black communities, AIAN, 
LGBTQIA plus immigrants, refugees, those with limited English speaking, um, those living with disabilities. Next slide, please. This is the investment area and program requirements. The background is why this RFP process is being held. The service program models is how and what, uh, the client eligibility is who, as well as the population. The service components are also how the program is being implemented. The performance commitments are the results we hope to obtain. And the key staff is who is going to provide the services. Next slide, please. As some background on the RFP process, HSD has moved to adopt the term gender-based violence is a response to an alignment with regional and national efforts. While gender-based violence impacts all communities, research and data shows marginalized populations, including women of color, immigrant and refugees, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer communities, and individuals living with disabilities are more likely to be victimized. An aim of this RFP is to ensure that survivor populations that are the most targeted, vulnerable, and least likely to access supports and services are reached. In addition, improving data collection and research while maintaining the safety of survivors will be the, of utmost priority for this RFP. Next slide, please. This is an overview of the investment area. I suggest that you hone in on this slide. Um, this is a slide where you can use to formulate ideas for your application and when writing narrative responses. This is a focal point because this is the purpose of the RFP. It's to strengthen Seattle's coordinated regional response network for survivors of gender-based violence and to invest in programs that integrate the following culturally relevant strategies. Enhance partnerships and collaboration. We wanna really build a community. Seamless coordinated response access and referral for GBV service delivery focused on race and social justice, as well as disability and sexual orientation, gender identity. It's survivor-centered, non-judgmental, and trauma-informed. Um, the deep understanding of the discriminatory gendered nature of violence, as well as its causes and consequences. And we also want to promote organizations that prioritize and promote staff welfare, value self-care, sustainability, and capacity building. Next slide, please. These are the five um, service program models that we'll invest in. Mobile flexible advocacy, shelter housing, therapeutic services, civil legal aid, and specialized services for marginalized populations. And we'll get into each of these strategies in the next slides. Next, please. Mobile flexible advocacy, MFA, is the first program model. MFA, community, sexual assault, domestic violence, and legal, is survivor-driven and trauma-informed. Advocates work in partnership with survivors, focus on self-determination, empower survivors to be safe and rebuild control over their own lives. Survivors lead the process, choose their own goals and define what is most safe for them. Advocates are able to meet with survivors safely in the community rather than requiring survivors to travel to agency-based locations. MFA seeks to lower the barriers that prevent survivors from accessing specialized GBB supports by offering flexible and comprehensive services. Next slide, please. And here are some of the components of mobile flexible advocacy and the program elements. We have community-based advocacy and navigation, which is general gender-based violence, legal and specialized domestic violence, sexual assault. There's information and referral, there's safety planning, there's flexible client assistant, which um, is monetary, emotional support and advocacy based on counseling, support groups, and gender-based violence-centered edu education. Next slide, please. This is our shelter and housing program model. Shelter and housing includes various time-limited supportive housing program models to address the spectrum of needs for survivors and their families, including emergency shelter, transitional housing, bridge housing, rapid rehousing. All housing options are based on DV housing first and should meet basic needs such as safety, food, and shelter. All models have low barriers for eligibility and there are no requirements to participate in services that are provided. 
However, case management and advocacy are, of course, integral to these housing program models' ability to meet survivor needs and maintain safety. Next slide, please. Here is an overview of the shelter and housing models. Um, we find emergency shelter, which is short-term accommodation where an individualized assessment guides the survivor and their children to transition from homelessness to more stable housing. Locations are semi-confidential or confidential. There's also re rapid rehousing, which is a short-term progressive engagement housing intervention intended to quickly move survivors experiencing homelessness into permanent or more stable housing. Services emphasize addressing the immediate short-term barriers that prevent survivors from entering housing, while also using an appropriate time-limited level of support and financial assistance to resolve survivors' immediate housing crisis and maintaining at least monthly contact. Transitional housing is longer-term housing with supportive services designed to help survivors transition from homelessness to more stable permanent housing. The duration of stay in the program is approximately nine to 24 months, then survivors even move to appropriate permanent or more stable housing. Bridge housing is similar to transitional housing, but it's usually a quicker model. A type of transitional housing or extended stay shelter up to six months or longer, depending on circumstances, that emphasize stabilization through short lengths of stay and rapid connections to permanent, more stable housing. Next slide, please. This is our therapeutic services model. The role of therape therapeutic services to provide immediate and follow-up medical and psychological assistance to those who have been affected by gender-based violence. Additionally, sexual assault specific advocates, social workers assist with immediate needs following a sexual assault and in conduct initial assessments of trauma impact. Information is provided about trauma impact and brief intervention and or trauma-focused therapy is offered. Some program service examples are a 24-hour hotline providing sexual assault crisis intervention, information and referral. Mobile and or drop-in health centers or clinics focused on commercially sexually exploited individuals in specific Seattle neighborhood hotspots such as Aurora Avenue. Sexual assault nurse examiner, SANE program that provides expert medical, forensic, psychological care to sexual assault survivors. Next slide, please. Here are some of the components of therapeutic services. Crisis intervention, which can be medical or psychological. Information and referral co-advocacy, medical clinics, short-term individual and group therapy support groups, 24-hour hotline, the same program models and safety risk assessments. Next slide, please. Michelle, I just want to pause. Um, there's a few questions in the chat box um, regarding the last two strategies you just described. Okay. So the first um, question is um, from Robin. If you'd like to speak to your question, feel free to unmute yourself or else I could read it out loud. Well, just my question is for transitional housing, does it need to be located within the city limits of Seattle? We're going to get on to the program um, eligibility as well as client eligibility, and it does not have to be um, within Seattle city limits. Um, and please um, refer to the um, eligibility for agencies in the funding website um, that'll tell you more about the fact that you need to have a Seattle business license um, and be registered here in Seattle. Um, but for some programs, sometimes being outside of Seattle so city limits is actually a safer option for some survivors. Um, and I will go into the eligibility requirements for the actual participants later on in the slides. And Lon, do you have anything else to add to that? Or Judith? No, I think... Um... I'll go to the next question posted on the chat by Mary regarding therapeutic services model. Mary, would you like to speak to your question? Otherwise, I can also read it out loud. I'll go ahead and read it. Does the therapeutic services model need to include 
all of the elements. No, it does not. Great. You, you base your application on essentially what you feel that your agency can supply to the population and services that you're able to commit to. Great, thanks, Michelle. Yeah, any other questions? Okay, here we have our civil legal services program model. Funding civil legal service services will improve access to justice, increase safety and stability for gender-based violence survivors. Holistic civil legal services will reduce the costs and barriers to accessing Washington courts. Legal financial burdens have the greatest impact on single mothers, BIPOC, LGBTQIA populations, and those with disabilities. Successful applicants for this program model will have substantial training providing civil legal services to gender-based violence survivors, as well as in-house or referral agencies, immigration attorneys, and or language access services. Next slide, please. Here are some of the components of civil legal services, including direct legal representation for civil court cases by qualified attorneys, legal counseling and advice, legal clinics, training and education, legal information and referral, and legal hotline services. Next slide, please. And this is actually a new strategy for 2022 although we've implemented, implemented some of these strategies in other um, of our program models in the past. This is our specialized services for marginalized populations. This investment strategy will specifically fund community grassroots domestic violence, commercial sexual exploitation and sexual assault agencies that are created and led by the most vulnerable populations, black and indigenous people of color, BIPOC, AI, AN, AP, AI, Latinx, immigrants and refugees, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer individuals, people living with disabilities, and survivors of commercial sexual exploitation. Programming and gender-based violence solution strategies for marginalized communities are peer-led, culturally informed, and emphasize community building. Funds may be used to implement new or enhance existing culturally specific services, develop or enhance outreach strategies to better reach underserved survivors, increase capacity for population specific organizations to better serve gender-based violence survivors. Next slide, please. Here are the specialized services for marginalized populations. The service components include outreach and education, community mobilization strategies, culturally specific community and systems engagement, harm reduction outreach to survivors of commercial sexual exploitation, interpreter services and limited English speaker immigrant and refugee advocacy, peer led and culturally based solutions to gender based violence, a peace in the home helpline and distribution of survival safety supplies. Next slide, please. And do we have any questions? You can open up, um, you can unmute yourself if you'd like to ask any questions and Judith can call on you if you raise your hand. I also just wanted to note that uh, this isn't the end of the presentation. We still have a bit more on uh, the logistics of the app actual application. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Isaac. Yeah, no problem. So we have a question um, from Emily in the chat. Emily, would you like to speak to your question? Yeah, my question is just uh, whether or not this can uh, serve minors. Yes. We also have a hand raised from Robin. Yeah, thank you. Um, for the specialized services for marginalized, it looks like it needs to be new services or expanded or enhanced. So it can't be a continuation of existing services. It can be a um, continuation of existing services. Just if you're mindful of um, the strategies that are involved in supplying these services. Okay, thank you. Yep. 
as I mentioned, we've been kind of utilizing these strategies in the past, so we want to continue. Michelle, we also have a question from Mary Ellen Stone. Um, will we get the slide deck presentation? Yes, yes. It'll be posted on the HSD website and we'll also email it out to folks. And if you don't receive one, please feel free to email me and I'll send it to you. And we're also taking notes today. As well as the recording. Thanks, Mary Ellen. See someone else's hand up. <laughs> Hi everyone. I was wondering um, if there's a percentage or a limit for the flexible funds available for survivors. If there's amount of money, is that what you're asking? Yes, if there's a specific amount that would be awarded or a percentage out of the award that would be allocated. Not yet. That's something that you would determine on your own as an agency, how much you would need and successfully, you know, allocate to folks. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Go ahead. Whoever um, has a question, I cannot. You can feel feel free to unmute yourself. Okay, uh, we can come back and feel free to raise your hand if you uh, want to speak to your question. We did have a follow up on the slide deck of by when um, will the slide deck be sent out or posted? I would say within 48 hours. Great. Um, I do not see any other hands raised or questions Thanks. in the chat. Well, thanks so much for all those great questions. And like I said, if you have any other questions, please feel free to email me. I had one quick question. Um, sure. I was wondering if there's capacity building funds that would be available, especially for grassroots um, organizations separate from what's in the RFP. Lon, I think this would be a question for you if you're here. <laughs> Is Lon here? <laughs> And if we can't answer your question, we'll obviously get back to you and we can post it on the website. I just wanted to let Lon know, I think you're muted because I can hear you, but. Um, oh, okay. Can you, you hear me now? Sorry about yep. that. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, can I have the question be repeated? Yes. Um, I was wondering if there are funds for capacity building aside mm -hmm. from what's listed in the RFP, especially for uh, small organizations. Mm -hmm. Um, what is included in the RFP is mainly what is written in the document itself. Uh, I think it's good for us to know if there's need for capacity building because that that would if if that ever comes up, it would be a separate process. Um, but it's really good to know. So if there is a need that folks in the space feel um, related to capacity building, it definitely is information that we will take with us and if there's an opportunity to um, put towards that direction that we that it definitely would be a consideration. Um, but thanks for the question. This is definitely helpful to know. Thank you. Great. I also want to tell everyone that Lon said this owl will look like me, so I just <laughs> Because it's so cute <laughs> and inquisitive. <laughs> okay, on that note, <laughs> next slide. <laughs> um, here's the client eligibility that I mentioned earlier. Survivors may be of any gender, sexual orientation, age, rage, eth race, ethnicity. I have a little bit of rage. <laughs> ethnicity with a focus on BIPOC communities. American Indians, Alaskan Native, Black, African Americans, Asian, and Pacific Islander, Latinx, immigrants and refugees, those living with disabilities, LGBTQIA individuals, and they may be domestic or foreign nationals. 
Eligible clients must meet one or more of the following eligibility requirements, either live or work in the city of Seattle, be enrolled in a Seattle-based academic institution, seek gender-based violence services from a Seattle-based gender-based violence services organization, or be involved in a Seattle police investigation, and um, or the income must be less than 200% of the current national poverty level, which in 2022 is $27,180 for a single household. Next slide, please. Here's where we get into some of the population data that um, fed our RFP process. Um, but before we move on to this, I'd like to take a moment to reflect and humbly honor all survivors and honor and show appreciation for all of you who work with this population, because we know that this is a really difficult job to have and with limited resources and um, with all the things going on in society right now. So I'd like to pause for that. Um, this population data is not just statistics, it's actual folks that um, are experiencing violence and suffering um, in our community. Gender-based violence is widely underreported, which makes it challenging to capture data, especially within immigrant and refugee populations and communities of color. Worldwide, worldwide less than 40% of women who experience gender-based violence seek help of any sort. Of those, less than 10% seek assistance from the police. Available data tells us that gender-based violence disproportionately impacts marginalized communities. American Indian, Alaskan Native, Black, African American, or two or more races experience gender-based violence at a higher rate than the general population. Native Americans are victims of rape and or assault at more double the rate of other populations. 21 to 55% of Asian Pacific Islander women report experiencing intimate partner violence. 56% of American Indian, Alaskan Native women have experienced sexual violence. 55% have experienced intimate partner violence. 43.8% of lesbian women and 61.1% of bisexual women have experienced gender-based violence. 26% of gay men and 37% of bisexual men have experienced gender-based violence. More than 80% of women with disabilities have been sexually assaulted. And please refer to the theory of change in pages seven to eight of the RFP application for more statistics and all reference links in this application. It's pretty grim. Next slide, please. So, you know, the uh, population priority and focus uh, is not restricted to the populations I'm going to mention but please have data to back up justification for serving um, any populations that are not mentioned. The priority population, low-income victims, survivors of gender-based violence, domestic violence, sexual assault, and our commercial sexual exploitation in Seattle. Our focus populations are American Indian, Alaska Native, Black African American, Asian Americans, Pacific Islander, Latinx Hispanic, LGBTQIA+, individuals living with disabilities, immigrants, refugees. Next slide, please. Here are the performance measures. Uh, these are included in the 2023 contracts and may be familiar to those who are currently partnering with us. Um, the performance measures are quantity, the number of survivors of gender-based violence by gender and race ethnicity served, so who is getting services, the number of MODVSA meetings attended by providers, the quality, the percent of survivors satisfied with the quality of services provided as measured by a client survey or interview, the percent of survivors from focus population satisfied with the quality of services provided as measured by a client survey or interview, the percent of survivors who can, who can identify immediate next steps as measured by a client survey or interview, the percent of survivors from focus population who can identify immediate next steps as measured by a client survey or interview. Next slide, please. Here are some more performance measures. What is the impact? Percent of survivors who report progress goals towards service plan goals as measured by the contract status report. The percent of survivors from focus population who demonstrate progress towards service plan goals as measured by a contract status report. 
The percent of survivors to increase safe housing stability, which only applies to housing strategies, as measured by the contract status report. And also the percent of survivors from focused populations who increase safe housing stability, which only applies to housing service strategies, as measured by a contract status report. Next slide, please. Here are the key staffing requirement, those that are gonna be providing the services. There should be sufficient qualified culturally and linguistically competent staff to effectively conduct the strategies outlined and activities proposed. Successful applicants must obtain the required level of training for the specific GBV populations being served in proposed program models. All program staff, supervisors, and volunteers must be familiar with the dynamics of domestic violence, sexual assault, and commercial sexual exploitation and relevant community resources. In addition, all attorneys providing legal representation must be licensed to practice law in the state of Washington, be a member of the Washington State Bar Association. And on another note, please ensure that your agency's staffing table is included in your RFP documents in the application. Next slide, please. Here are the fiscal documents that are required. Agencies for which HSD has current financial and insurance documents will not be required to resubmit. But please contact your program specialist if you are unsure by July 29th, 2022, or you can also email myself, michelle.smith2 at seattle.gov. Agencies for which HSD has incomplete or no financial or insurance documents will be notified by the coordinator and required to submit all requested documents within four business days from the date of written request. This is tentatively scheduled for the beginning of September. So make sure you have all your needed documents um, organized before that date. Financial and insurance documentation that may be requested are listed in section four of the RFP application. Next slide, please. Again, here's the review and rating summary timeline, just as a reminder, and these dates are subject to change. Applications need to be submitted by August 8th. Fiscal reviews are going to be happening around September 12th. Interviews may be scheduled per rate of request. That's happening between the 12th and 15th of September. We're hopefully um, going to have the rating committee review completed by September 16th. And then final recommendations for awardings are made to Ellis to the agency director late September 2022. And then agency awards and public announcement would happen sometime mid-October 2022. Next slide, please. Here's our rating and scoring sum summary. Just to note that raters are chosen from a spectrum of experts, GBV, funding, homelessness, gender equality racial equity, among others. Um, this is to prevent bias. These independent raters will be scoring all applications and will make funding recommendations to HSD. There is um, a proposal session, section that's an agency-specific core narrative question. You only do that once for each application. And please note that there is different weighting ascribed to each type of um, proposal. The agency's description is 10 points. The cultural responsiveness is 20 points. Agency staffing, data, and financial management are 20 points, and partnerships and collaboration are also 10. And then the strategy-specific narrative questions are completed per program design. So when you submit your application, if you're applying for more than strat one strategy, just do one agency-specific core narrative question section, and then do as many strategy-specific narrative questions that you're applying for, which would be one application. Program design description is 25 points. That's very important. Budget and leveraging is worth 15 points for a total of 100 for the entire application. Next slide, please. And happily, we're going to be offering technical assistance for all RFP applicants. The Mayor's Office on Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault, MODVSA, offers technical assistance to support community-based organizations applying for funds through a request for proposal. This support reflects our commitment to partnering with organizations that are grounded in the communities they serve and able to provide high-quality, impactful services to our focused populations. 
The technical assistance provided can be tailored to your organization needs and priorities. MODVSA is partnering with Forge and Bloom, who I'll introduce in a moment, Tara James. Um, Tara has had 20 years of experience in program development and management, fundraising, and communication. Tara brings a fierce commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Her work centers on helping organizations thrive internally through strategic planning, effective management, impactful leadership while serving their communities. And now I'd like to introduce Tara James. Tara, are you with us? Um, thanks, Michelle. Yay. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Next slide, please. <laughs> Tara, if you want to give some information about the technical assistance that you'll be offering. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm very excited to be part of this. And just to give you guys an idea of what is offered through TA sessions. We're going to be having a handful of um, office hours as well as one-on-one um, -on -one appointments that you can set up at your convenience. Um, and in those sessions, um, TA includes not writing the application for you, but we can talk through whether your programs are a good fit, whether your agency met, meets the minimum qualifications, sort of that, that baseline of the applications. We can help you um, communicate why your organization and program should be funded. What makes your um, program, your team, your organization really unique in this space and why you're the best agency to do this particular work. Um, I can also answer questions about the process and offer you support around completing um, the application, filling out the online um, application, which is a one shot deal. You can't save your documents on there, so you have to do it all in one go. So how you prepare all of your materials so that you can upload them and submit all in the same setting. And then I can also review draft proposals and budgets to give you very specific feedback. Okay, next slide. slide. <laughs> so I mentioned that we have some office hours coming up. So this week we have three office hours, um, July 20th uh, from 10, to, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., July 21st, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m., July 22nd, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. And then August 3rd, we also have 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. There is a link that you can click on and you'll see the different 30 minute blocks and you can just click the link um, and select the time that works best for you. And we will meet from there. Um, we also have um, other dates. If you're not available on one of these four days during those time periods, you can also schedule a one-on-one -on -one, um, directly through the second. Someone needs to be muted. <laughs> I, say, I wasn't sure if I heard a question or... <laughs> um, let's see, next slide, please. Okay, so do we have any questions for Tara? Anyone from Mr. Seward? <laughs> and I'm really excited to be partnering with you, Tara. Me Thank too. You. And I will be watching the chat. So if anybody has questions, feel free to put it in the chat. Truth, do we have any questions for Tara? No, I do not see any new questions in the chat or anyone who um, has their hand raised. It looks like Elizabeth has a question about, are you limited to meeting with the TAs once? Um, that would be preferable because we want to um, give everybody a chance to to access the TA. However, if there are openings, um, I'm I'm not going to turn anybody away. <laughs> but we'll try and be really efficient and focused. So, um, yeah. Great. Sorry. Thanks. Sorry, Elizabeth. I missed your question. If you have any follow up, please feel free to unmute yourself. Um, and there's another question from Robin. To have a draft review, do we need to schedule a meeting time? That would be great. And when you schedule the meeting time, you can send the draft um, in advance or we can talk about it right in the meeting time um, so that 
you know, I can take a look at it before we meet or we can just talk about it in real time either way. Great, thanks, Tara. Thank you. Thanks, Tara. And feel free to email Tara if you have any other questions or myself. Um, here's some tips for um, submitting your application. Um, make sure you refer to the application submission checklist, follow the required format defined in the guidelines. Um, don't exceed the 30 page limit for your application. And that's inclusive of your agency description as well as if you were applying for all five program areas. Be specific, detailed, yet concise. Submit an accurate budget, double check your numbers. Review the online submission assistance page several times. Email questions by the question and answer deadline, which is July 29th, 2022, to me, Michelle Smith, michelle.smith2 at seattle.gov. Any questions before I keep going? Okay, next slide, please. Here's some more information about submitting your application. Um, completed application packets are due by noon on Monday, August 8th, 2022. Proposals must be submitted through the HSD online submission system or via email, not both. No hand delivered, faxed, or emailed proposals uh, or mailed proposals will be accepted. Allow ample time for uploading and confirmation of receipt. Um, you can submit via the HSD online submission system, which is http slash w6 web 6seattlegovernor slash hsd slash rfi slash index dot aspx. HSD advises uploading proposal documents several hours prior to the deadline in case you encounter an issue with your internet co connectivity. HSD is not responsible for ensuring that applications are received by the deadline. But if you encounter issues with the online submission system, please email Sola Plumarker at sola.plumarker at seattle.gov. Or you can submit via email, um, but email attachments are limited to 30 megabytes. The subject heading must be titled 2022 Gender-Based Violence Services RFP. Any risks associated with submitting a proposal by email are borne by the applicant. Applicants will receive an email acknowledging the receipt of their application. Next slide, please. And yet again, some more information about submitting your online um, application. The system is not an online application like other web-based application um, sites. You may upload files up to a maximum of 100 megabytes, which is more than the email, which is only 30. Acceptable file types include PDF, doc, docx, RTF, XLS, or XLSX. There are required fields to be completed. Ensure you allow sufficient time to, to complete the steps in order to submit your application by the deadline. The system automatically sends a confirmation to all email addresses you enter. Late applications will not be accepted. HSD is not responsible for ensuring that applications are received by the deadline. Next slide, please. There is an appeal process and grounds for appeal. So applicants have a right to protest or appeal certain decisions in the award process. Um, this includes a violation of policies or failure to adhere to guidelines or published criteria and or procedures established in the funding opportunity by HSD or MODVSA. Um, the appeal deadline is um, within four days from the date of written application status when the awards are notified. A written decision by HSD director will be made within four business days of the receipt of the appeal. The HSD director's decision is final. No contracts resulting from the solicitation will be executed until the appeal process has closed. An appeal may not prevent HSD from issuing an interim contract for services in order to meet important client needs. Next slide, please. For official questions and answers, contact me, Michelle Smith, with questions prior to Friday, July 29th, 2022 by 4 p.m. Questions and answers will be posted on the HSD RFP funding website, Monday, August 1st, 2022. Here's the link. 
for the HSD RFP funding website, which Judith will put in the chat. Only written published answers on the HSD funding opportunities website are official, so we'd ask you not call with questions, but please email us. Any issues and or questions about the online submission system, contact Sola Plumacher, Funding Process Advisor at 206-247-1645, or email her at sola.plumacher at seattle.gov. Next slide, please. And do we have any other questions before we end? I see a hand raised. Yeah, I had a question about that. You know, going back to the specialized services for marginalized populations, um, if you are um, if you are thinking about doing a program within your agency about around specialized populations, but you're not um, necessarily a grassroots agency, where would that fall? Would that fall under? you know, some of our therapeutic supports, or does that also fall under our specialized services? Just just trying to figure out how we would frame that. I think if you're um, thinking of serving the marginalized populations, you might want to just apply for it anyways, and just apply for all, you know, so that you can get the applications in. So in case one application isn't successful, that the other ones are. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep. I do, more not, I do not see, oh, there's a question that just came in from Emily. Will this funding be renewed after one year? Yes, it will be funded for four years. Um, and that's also contingent upon program performance, however. But we do the funding cycle every four years. So there was a still... question. Oh, oh go okay. ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no, go no, ahead. This, um, came in privately. Is there a, if folks are applying to more than one strategy, do they have to submit different budgets, a budget for each strategy that yes. they are proposing? They do. Um, another question from Angela. If I am under, Understanding correctly, we can request funding, but not additional staff for program expansion needs. You can. Um, it's up to you to determine what your needs are. Okay, thank you. I thought kind of earlier that um, capacity building was separate, so I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I don't see any more questions coming through the chat. I'm just looking for any hand raised. And I don't see any as well. Okay, well, I'd like to thank you all for partnering with us to build a safer, healthier and more just community. And Bell Hooks is one of my favorite authors. So I wanted to leave us with a quote by her. Dominator culture has tried to keep us all afraid to make us choose safety instead of risk sameness instead of diversity, moving through that fear, finding out what connects us, reveling in our differences. This is a process that brings us closer, that gives us a world of shared values and a meaningful community. Thank you so much, everyone. I appreciate you all. And I'll stay on for a while in case any other questions come up. Sounds good. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay. Yeah, we'll stay on for like five more minutes. Does that work for everyone? Works for me. Okay. Hello, Michelle. This is Angela with Dawn. How are you? Hi, Angela. Yeah, I'm trying to turn on my camera here. <laughs> 
sometimes makes my internet get goofy and sometimes it doesn't. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad it didn't for me today. <laughs> No, I appreciate just kind of quickly. I've been taking a lot of notes and I know the recording will be on the HSD site, but this is a really exciting funding opportunity and mm -hmm. a lot of the service areas, you know, Dawn has are able to expand upon. So I see in the RFP, you know, and I'll, I'll call it an estimated amount of allocated funds. Uh, but if I was hearing correctly, we build our budgets per service area we're applying to. Yes. Um, and then kind of see from there. So, uh, for example, we have a currently we we already have an emergency shelter. So mm -hmm. I could ask for what I'm assuming the eligible expenses are like some extra staff to provide different types of services. This is not like an expansion of extra units to our mm -hmm. shelter. Yeah, I mean, uh, you could have apply for different. Um, types of strategies too, um, with the emergency shelter as well as advocates or any of the other strategies that you're interested in. So. Okay, but the funds cannot be built, so to speak, if we want like three more units for shelter rooms. Oh, I, I, I'm pretty sure it can, Lon. Hope you're there and you're not on mute, Lon. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am sorry. Um... Can you repeat that? Yeah. Hi, Lon. Um, <laughs> Hi, Angela. Just really excited about this RFP opportunity. And so just kind of looking at the, the areas of, of funding, of course, you know, there's shelter and community advocacy, all of which Dawn currently has. Um, from an expansion opportunity, or if it is capacity building, if we were to apply to the service area of shelter, would that include um, either adding extra rooms to our shelter or additional opportunity to expand space? Hmm. Um, I think we're not in the position to give any feedback on your sort of program needs, so we can't answer that. Right. We probably have okay. our own thoughts about that, but it would be up to you. What we can say, though, is that, uh, okay. as Michelle mentioned, this is a, uh, this RFP has specific uh, strategies. Uh, they are shelter housing, all that's listed. Um, it did not call out capacity building. So if you were to apply for capacity building, it has to be attached to an existing uh, one of the listed strategies. So your direction on that is, is is fine. So I think it depends on what you feel are the needs and priority for your expansion. Um, okay. And as long as um, I think, uh, you know, I think what Michelle's mentioned too is just make the case for that based on mm -hmm. your interactions with your clients, with the with the demographics of the community, um, all the means that you have used to have this idea about expansion, I think just be as mm -hmm. clear as possible. And okay. um, yeah. Yeah, no, what, I, what is that? Yeah, I appreciate that and appreciate and respect the RFP process. I know sometimes there's ineligible expenses and eligible expenses. So I just wanted mm -hmm. to make sure I was acknowledging both. That is all I have. <laughs> Great, thank you. Thanks for your interest. Looking forward to reviewing your application. Thank mm -hmm. you. I appreciate the huddle up call. I have all kinds of notes and all the links yes. saved from the chat box. So <laughs> great. Awesome. Thank you. You all have a good rest of your afternoon. You Thanks, too, Angela. Angela. You too. Take Bye. care. Are we all staying on for our, or are we going to another meeting to? Um, we have a debrief that's scheduled for much later, but maybe we can just uh, move that up if that's okay with you guys. Do you want to take a little break? Maybe take a, a little break and maybe at 2.30, does that sound like a good time to do a debrief? So I'll move our debrief time up. Yeah, that sounds great to me. Okay, and so we'll be debriefing both um, info sessions. Cool. And uh, I just copied the the chat, and we'll make sure to save that. I don't know. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. you guys did a great job. Yeah. yeah. Who's that? Who's that? <laughs>
Yeah, you did a wonderful job. And I think, I mean, the RFP itself has so much information and it's so clear. Uh, mm -hmm. and so uh, I like the fact that we are just referring to that. I think that, that um, allows for us to have the same messaging for everyone as we just refer back mm -hmm. to the document. Um, I tell you all, this lavender spray is the key. <laughs> I did this before my interview and I did this today. <laughs> Were you at home? You can use lavender in the office. We might need sage. So that's a little bit of a different spray, but you'll have to, you'll have to keep a little satchel in your desk that you can just yeah. occasionally. Uh, whatever it is, it worked and it's great, but I always I, we thought it was going to go well, so that was not a surprise. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good job. Um, great. Great job, right. Michelle. We'll see you yeah. at 2.30. Good job to you both. See you guys at 2.30. Thanks, Tara. See you. Thank you, Thank you Tara. Isaac. Thanks, Judith. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Bye-bye. Thanks, Anna. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>